6.32. This is the earliest starting 6.30 lecture at GSAP this semester, but I'm determined to keep us on time. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming out this evening to our really great, I hope, no, really great lecture this evening. Um, we hear so often about buildings here at GSAP. It's rather rare that we hear from the architects and the client at the same time. And I think this evening's presentation on the armory uh, will be interesting because it's a fabulous building with fabulous work that's been done, but also because we will hear the perspectives of the architects and the client. I'm told that the three presenters this evening are going in order of Rebecca Robertson from the armory, um, Askan Mergenthaler of the Herzog and Demuron firm, and finishing up is Charles Platt from Platt Byer DeVell White here in New York. I would like to briefly introduce them. These are all people of multi-talents and multi-credentials. Um, they will give a presentation of their work and then we will open to some discussion about the role of architecture, preservation, his adaptation of buildings, clients, architects, and all that good stuff. Rebecca Robertson is the president and executive directory of the Park Avenue Armory and has held that position for six years now. Um, she's spearheading the current $200 million restoration of the 7th Regiment Armory and helping to transform this enormous building into an enormously present part of the New York cultural scene. Um, Rebecca, may I call Rebecca, Ms. Robertson, um, is really championing a change of the armory which was known for the winter antique shows and a few other rather frosty uh, events into a really vibrant center for visual and performing arts, um, including bringing Shakespeare there. Um, they commission programs with um, various installation artists and because of the size of the space, things can be done in the armory drill hall that are unique to that space and really activate it again. Um, Rebecca is the client, in, appearing in the role of the client is Rebecca Robertson and I'm sure she will have um, some wonderful commentary about this relationship that, that she and the architects have developed. Askan Mergenthaler is the representative to us from Herzog and Demuron who are the architects of, of record for the project. Um, Herzog and Demuron uh, done a lot of amazing work around the world, um, are known for sort of surface texture. Askan Mergenthaler is a senior partner in the firm and is based here in New York for, for the length of this project. Um, he's done work at the Tate Modern, speaking of large buildings with, with space for modern art, um, working in Brazil, uh, New York, Berlin, San Francisco, and so on. Uh, Herzog and Demuron received the Pritzker Prize in 2001, the Reba Gold Medal and Premium Imperiale in 2007, and I hope receive lots more awards for this project as well. And finally, but, but very importantly, Charles Platt, um, partner at Platt Byer DeVell White, firm here in New York that's been around for a number of years and has had a significant presence in the preservation of many New York buildings. Charles, I know, has a personal interest in Landmarks Preservation, having served on the Landmarks Preservation Commission um, with the Municipal Art Society, and also is looking at projects um, as a modern architect and serving on the board of 40, New 42 Inc., working to redevelop 42nd Street, uh, the Gracie Mansion Conservancy, and um, has been a board member at the Augusta Sanko Downs Memorial. I would like to welcome all three of our speakers. We'll start by hearing from Rebecca, and I look forward to your presentations. Thank you so much. Oh, I guess we should stand. How's this work? All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Good evening. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, my task this evening is to address three things. Uh, first, the history of Park Avenue Armory, to tell you a little bit about the building itself. Uh, second, to talk a little bit about how we're reinventing it as a new cultural institution for New York City. And then finally, to talk about the design briefs that we gave to the architects with respect to many issues, but including preservation and design. 
Um, so let me just start with the building. Is this good? Am I doing it the right way? That way, okay, gotcha. Okay, so even as the armory was being designed in the late uh, 1870s, it was kind of destined to be over the top and lavish. It doesn't look like this now, but this was the way it was originally built. It had this Italianate campanile. It was a very romantic building. The parapets on the side of the building were very low, so you could have this sense of a, a kind of palazzo-like building that was um, that fronted on Lex. It was built for New York's richest, for and by richest uh, New York's richest families, and it was really a place that was not only for military drilling, but it was also absolutely overtly a social club and a place of public gathering. Today it's rather more militaristic, and this happened later on in its history, when the Campanile was destroyed, when the, um, that slender tower, tower, which is actually splayed, was made square when crenellations were added to the building. On the first and second floors, you have this just incredible collection of buildings that are really the most important collection of the American aesthetic movement um, rooms in the country. They have, uh, there are the, among their designers is Stanford White, Louis Comfort Tiffany, um, and Potty and Stymus, and the Herder Brothers. They are certainly considered among some, perhaps the most col important collection of 19th century interiors in, in the country. Extravagant in their concept and meticulous in their execution. It is just extraordinary how lavish these rooms were. They have beautiful design. Their woodwork is incredibly intricate and gorgeous and different in every single room. They have stencil patterns that just abound. They have a lot of freehand painting, which is really beautiful, and an extensive use of metallics. Here we see that some of the details of the room that is the veterans room that perhaps is the best known of all of these rooms. Um, each of these rooms um, were, was, had a singular, single client group, which is, I think, a very interesting fact to understand about the armory. So it wasn't as if you had one interior designer do all of the interiors. In fact, for each one of the 18 rooms, there was a separate client group. And we know from the minutes of their meetings that they cared enough about this work that they actually would vote on wood versus mahogany, you know, where they would spend their money, how they wanted their balustrades to look. So this was a group of, of clients who were incredibly um, uh, well well placed to understand the arts. They were patron of the arts themselves and they were real risk takers. So this is the, this is the, um, oops, the veterans room of course, which is perhaps the best known of all these rooms. But it was really crazy. This was a, a, a collaboration of the artistic, um, the uh, associated artists with uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany kind of leading the band. Uh, he was very young, as was Louis Comfort Tiffany, who was actually in his early, uh, sorry, as, as was Stanford White, who was in his, his um, mid-twenties when he worked on this room. Many, many artists came to work on it, and Scribner's, when it was open to the public, Scribner's said that Louis Comfort Tiffany had lost control of his artists. And there is something in that, in that it's Haponese, it's, it's Moorish, it's Celtic, and it just has this extraordinary exuberance, which I think is really special, uh, in fact, in this whole building. It was a very innovative building and completely cutting edge in its way. So there's six of these rooms on the first floor. And then on the second floor, you have the lockers of the companies. These are not anybody's lockers that I know. Um, because look at them, they're gorgeous. So again, they went out, they hired these incredible designers to do this work, and they built these beautiful, beautiful rooms. And inside these gorgeous rooms, they kind of had festivities. So here you see that same um, company eye that we just saw, all festooned for some entertainments. And then there are some of the members themselves. Um, company I was particularly known as the theatrical company, and they really had a huge amount of fun. And I think this sense, this sort of spirit of, of of dreaminess and fantasy really invades this whole building as we get to know it better. And of course, foremost of, as a place of fantasy was the drill hall itself. So the drill hall is just enormous. It was the largest unobstructed space in Manhattan when it was built. And in 1879, they had a fair uh, that they, to raise money to decorate the rooms in, in the head house. And you can see how crazy this was. So it went for three weeks. They had ventriloquists and, and um, dancers and Punch and Judy shows and, and sword swallowers, everything you can imagine. They created these pavilions of all the exotic places in the world that they were interested in, Siam, China, Persia. And thousands and thousands of New Yorkers came and it really was a triumph of the season. The drill hall also 
from the very beginning had a sense about culture. So their first music concert, and this is a woodcut of it, had 6,000 people in the audience, 6,000, it's just amazing. Um, they had 1,200 in the chorus, 500 musicians, and they built an, uh, an organ that you can see at the very end of the hall, especially for this extraordinary concert. You can also see that they were already anticipating issues of acoustics because they have dampening, um, that those hanging uh, drops are definitely to dampen the acoustic sound. It's got a beautiful sound, but it needs dampening from time to time. Here's a very unusual photograph of 1882 showing another uh, music um, festival that they did, one of these monster concerts. Um, and their taste, while it ran to Beethoven and Bach, it also ran to um, Berlioz, who had, whose Requiem had its American premiere here at the, par at the Park Avenue Armory, then known as the 7th Regiment Armory. So this is definitely a place that was all about art from the very beginning. And I think that when we took the building over, there was something about this history that we had learned um, that told us that this is really where we wanted to go with this building. We wanted to kind of keep that, that lifeblood going, that sense of adventure and innovation and, and kind of being a little bit out of the box. And we were encouraged by many people in, in the city to really make this a space where you could only do work that needed a non-traditional space, something that needed to break the bounds of the proscenium, something that needed context to respond to. And this is very important because many single-purpose theaters are not built to have context except to be perfect for the particular physical requirements of a, of a, a production. But here, we want to have the history speak loud, and so do the artists who want us to have the speak loud. So we started off with something that we knew could be done nowhere but the armory, which was a performance piece with 12 motorcyclists who carved a Bryce uh, Marsden-like painting uh, into, the, into a 10,000-square-foot um, canvas among a lot, of mid, um, a lot of smoke and noise. Then we had this incredible opera, which could only have been done at the Armory, where actually the audience moved through the music, through the orchestra itself. And it was just, it was stunning, and it was beautiful, and the muscular nature of the drill hall was so perfect for the work. Then we had this complete confection by Ernesto Neto, um, where, which filled the whole building with, with or would fill the whole drill hall with gauze and spices, and kids ran crazily through it. It was just tremendously wonderful and the kind of thing that, that you really don't get to experience very often in more traditional spaces. Then we had this beautiful piece where we tried out music because th this was all about trying out different kinds of art forms in the space. This was a piece called the Nuxuit um, where we had 77 percussionists by John Luther Adams, a piece that, that evoked the sounds of the earth and the audience moved around as the sounds kind of forced them into different pathways and behaviors. Uh, Alex Ross called it one of the most rapturous uh, listening experiences of his life. Uh, and we followed that with a huge video piece. This is actually the second video piece that we had done, which was sort of a matrix-like environment, which again, a sound piece, but it created this sort of sonic beach, and people would come and sit for hours. It was, as the New York Times said, spectacular, trippy, and fun. Uh, and then, of course, we did Shakespeare, um, as Janet had, had mentioned. And the thing about Shakespeare is that we were able to give them what they needed, which was they wanted to bring their house with them. They were kind of like the turtle. They had to bring their shell with them. So we were really the only place that could, could do that. And they came, they built their courtyard theater, but they also inhabited our building for eight really glorious weeks where we had the Royal Shakespeare Company here. It was spectacular. Then, just this December, we discovered something totally new about our building, and Shen Wei discovered totally, something totally new about what he could do with choreography when he did a, new, a newly commissioned piece where the members of the audience actually joined the dancers and moved through the dancers as this work um, unfolded, and it was just transcendent. Um, and it was followed by the end of the Merce Cunningham Company, which were the final performances by the Merce Cunningham Company. They were in this vast space. We created sort of a landscape so you could see people everywhere, and people walked around and saw this beautiful, this beautiful building um, and this beautiful, these beautiful works. Uh, and then it was over. That was the end of the Merce Cunningham Company. So even in our historic rooms, we find that the, the artists want to respond to the space and respond to the history of the space. So we do a lot of performance in um, our rooms, which are not even close to being um, restored or renovated, except for two of them. 
Um, this is Ethel. We've done Rufus Wainwright, Tori Amos, a whole bunch of different people. We do visual art exhibits. We are part of the Whitney Biennial in 2008. Uh, we have a very strong artist in residence program, and I cannot tell you how much the artists in residence love being at the Armory. In fact, it's kind of hard to get them to move, to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is Julian Crouch. She's a set designer who has two pieces at the Metropolitan Opera this season. He's extraordinary. And then, dear to all of our hearts who work here, um, we use the rooms to teach kids about creative processes. And we have a wonderful program, but I've got to tell you that this building, its history, and what it means, and the spirit of this, this building, really infuses, I, I think, our programs with something very special. And it's really rather sweet that our kids call the Armory Narnia, which seems right. So, Obviously, this has worked really well for us. We, we feel we're on our way. Um, we've done a lot of great productions. Um, but I want to finish up by talking about why history is so important um, to what we are doing, history and preservation. And I think it's been in what we searched for when we came to the building. And Kirsten Riach, who is our building historian, has been so instrumental in helping us figure out what this building is all about. But we really studied it very, very hard. We've read minute books. We've been through stacks and stacks of stuff that we found in closets. And what was interesting was to try to, we were trying to find the DNA of the building. What was the spirit of this building that we could make into a continuum, that we could keep going? Because it seemed to us that, that preservation, to, to sort of try to freeze something in time at a moment that doesn't exist anymore is really artificial. And the best way to really understand history and make it personal and give it an emotional connection is to make it part of a life force that keeps going. So what was that DNA of this really crazy building? Um, and how could, we, how could we continue it and therefore make it better understood? And I hope that is what our adaptive reuse has done. I don't think we're doing anything foreign to this building. I think we're just doing what it wanted to become. This was its next step because it was sort of innovative and it was quirky and it was out of the box and I think that's what we're trying to do. So our, our brief to our architects was really threefold. First, which I think is the toughest of all, and it's a very serious brief, it's just to keep the soul and spirit of the building for artists and audiences. And I think that's no mean trick. Um, and Ozcon and Charles will talk about that. Um, the second was to return this building to the pantheon of great American public buildings, um, which I think it had gone out of being that. We want it to be that again. Uh, and then the third was to make it functional for all the art forms that we want to do, to make it what is perhaps a complete, um, probably not even possible, is to make it truly flexible so that when artists come in here, they can dream big and audiences can have experiences that they've never had before. So that was the brief, and now Oscon's going to tell you how he did it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I will try to explain a little bit the process, um, because I think the process has been um, the most important experience in this project for all of us. And um, it's ongoing, and it's never completed. And um, we had a little bit of process even today, which was nice. <laughs> and um, so that is really what, what ultimately is driving us as a team, I think, that we really learned that we have to be in these spaces, um, make a lot of tests, listen to what the experts have to say, what everybody has to say in that team, um, and then we basically come up with a decision at the end of that. Um, but to, before I do this, I, I make a little um, detour to London, um, to the Tate Modern, because for many reasons um, there are some similarities between these two projects which um, I would like to uh, point out. Uh, most importantly, um, and I think that's what Rebecca's piece was about, is really the programming of the building. And the programming of the building does um, trigger certain responses from us. And that was exactly the case also for the Tate, that you know this industrial building, and that we basically kept the uh, industrial character of it. Actually, we, we even um, strengthened it even more by uh, gutting the turbine hall. But you know the reason we... we um, won this competition in that time was because we were kind of the only proposal who basically kept this core piece, the soul, so to say, or the heart of this building and made it the centerpiece of the new building. And 
Um, it still speaks of the um, original industrial character, but it becomes this tremendous art space, you know, and which has been so successful. And it's not only a great art space, it's also a great public space. And I think that's also exactly the aim we have here for the Armory, that we want to create something truly amazing for the performing arts, for the visual arts, but also for the public. So um, what, what happens in this space, which, which is mainly visual arts installation, this is Olaf Wurlison's piece, for example, uh, Weather Project, or uh, Anish Kapoor, uh, Ai Weiwei, uh, one of the latest ones. Um, we will continue in the extension. And um, it's so successful, you know, to use these um, given, the given DNA of this building to basically exploit it further and to, to make it really the next, the next thing um, that we always from the beginning knew that if we have to do an extension to this building, the next um, program bit we want to explore um, are the oil tanks of this building. You know, um, the oil tanks have been a fundamental part of this, of this power station and they are amazing spaces, um, and, and, and it's just only uh, natural to use them as the basement for the extension. And we will, like the turbine hall was the spine for the Tate Modern Project, the oil tanks will now become, um, so to say, the foundation for, for the new um, development um, spiraling upwards. And the thing is, you know, you find these spaces and you would never be able to design an art space like that, of course, you know, and you just find them and you use them and you, you are inspired by them and also for the artists react in a very different way to them. And this is the same case for curators, you know, it's, it's important sometimes that you ex escape from this white cube kind of gallery thinking and that you really have spaces which really force you to, to think very differently, very, very, um, uh, very uh, situative somehow. You have to react to the actual space. And that's what we all love and, and that's what we're basically also go doing there in a kind of special restoration, preservation piece of work. Um, it's actually not so different from what we do at the armory. You wouldn't believe it, but we do the same thing there. We map the concrete surfaces, you know, we check out where the damages are, where we have to do the patches and then the patches we try to do the roughest concrete we, you can get nowadays so that they basically blend into the overall very rough concrete which, which is there from the, from the 60s, basically. Um, and ultimately, they become these amazing art spaces where you can do installations which are not thinkable in other spaces. You know? And that is ultimately the reason, I think, why we're working on the um, Park Avenue project and um, why, we, why we are so excited about this commission when Rebecca came to us a couple of years ago. So the expense of spaces is even more diverse, of course, in this building. And I mean, not even more, it's ultimately more diverse. Um, and it's also interesting that um, it's these two extremes, you really have the big column-free drill hall space, which is, you know, quite a bit bigger than the turbine hall and has quite a few more potentials also than the turbine hall at Tate Modern. And you have the um, historic um, spaces, the 18 company and um, reception rooms, which are so special, like individual persons almost, you know, each of these rooms has a very different character. And you would always re react differently to, to each of these rooms. So the first thing what we basically did when we went into this building is that we did a very careful analysis of what the building is now. Without the history in mind, just what is the building now? And even now, without even starting the restoration or preservation work, or however you want to call it, you know, what makes this building already so special? And why do artists love it so much? You know? And, and there's a fundamental difference um, between these two things, and we thought it's important for us to try to map it down, what are these differences also between the drill hall and the uh, company rooms, you know. For example, if you look at the surfaces, you know, the company rooms are all about surfaces, all about decoration, about making the room very special, whereas the drill hall is only about infrastructure. Or uh, when you look into the infrastructure, you know, the light sources and so on, 
Um, everything is bare and exposed, of course, in the drill hall, whereas in the uh, company rooms, everything is very special and um, very specifically designed for each room. And last but not least, um, even for the furniture, you know, where you have like you did, you did um, very profane furniture for the uh, drill hall, you have very exquisite and carefully designed furniture for the spaces. So the drill hall for us was pretty soon a very um, easy thing to work with, um, although it was not so obvious because you know we spent quite a lot of time to figure out where would be the best space for the stage or where would be the best stage for the spectators or how can we make this flexible like this or flexible like that. And ultimately we understood that the only thing how we can do this is that we basically perceive the entire space as one stage. This is the stage, everything is stage, and therefore you can really do whatever you want with this thing. So then the job was relatively easy because it was just basically installing infrastructure to make this huge stage work. And then there's the same for the company rooms. You know, when you go in there right now, these are, these are more or less current shots of the office users in there. I mean, even when they're used as offices, they, are, they have something incredible inspiring somehow, and, and, and they have a, uh, a nonchalance and a directness uh, which, is, which is really hard to beat. And we don't want to lose this, you know, and, and, and we hope that this is still happening in one or the other way um, once we are done with all the rooms. And, and, and it's the most important thing we said that we don't want to um, encourage people to not use the spaces like this anymore and that they become basically dead spaces like museum spaces. So in the next step, um, we basically um, had great um, experts and teammates who, who did an excessive amount of research. Um, Kirsten was mentioned before, she basically, basically did the paperwork, you know, I mean, going through the photographs, through books, for essays and so on. Um, and it's very important and she's uh, amazing because you can ask her everything about each room and she knows exactly, okay, this is there, this happened then and so on. So it's really like, like her kind of building. And it's important that, I mean, that's, that's something an architectural team could not really do on ourselves, so we need this help, you know. And then, of course, we have other experts, uh, some of them are also in the audience, doing meticulous research on the different layers and um, particles of paint chips and microscopic things of what might have been there and so on. And all of this basically gives us an overall idea of what that um, building, what, uh, what the changes have been, uh, this building has been through. And that is a very important drawing because it basically shows us that each major alteration or campaign is highlighted in a different color. And everything which is original is basically um, black and white. So as you can see, there's not much of the original fabric there. I mean, basically, pretty much everything was altered or changed at some point of the time. And, and that also gave us, again, um, a lot of um, stimulus that it's completely okay for us to, to go there and, and, and basically try to understand what are these different layers and how can we basically take these different layers and, um, and make them work again for the, for the entire building. Um, the other thing we have to deal with are, of course, the damages. So also there we did extensive mapping of the different damages. And, um, you know, the, it's interesting that each room, we, we produce these drawings of each room. We know exactly where the cracks, where, where the, the, the bigger water damages, where, where the chases for the elect electrification. And, and, and these are really like scars, and the scars make, make this building ultimately so, so interesting also. And we came up with these, with these together with our lovely partner architect and, and expert team um, with these maps of each room where we know exactly what are the different layers, can we get to these layers, how expensive is it to get to these layers, and so on. So if for us, these are like little mini um, uh, guidelines of how we could tackle this and how, what is possible and what we can do. And this changes constantly because they constantly find out that maybe that layer is still accessible and it wasn't first and then it suddenly turns out to be accessible and so on. So how, um, I, will, I will briefly now talk about these two rooms, the Company D and Company E, which are the two pilot rooms which we finished. 
And um, I, I really start from scratch somehow really to explain a little bit what the journey was to get there um, where we are right now. So that was the room how we found it when we um, visited the armory first in 2007. And um, we kind of liked it. Um, <laughs> we liked the green, we liked the cables, and it was really, it had a, had a really cool atmosphere and we, we kind of liked it. So, um, and then we basically started our research and we found out that um, basically it's gonna be very difficult and almost impossible to delayer the, the entire room or to basically come back to the original surface. And at that time, um, you know, the, the experts basically went through the entire building and, and did little, little probes, little stamp-sized probes almost of what the different build-ups of these rooms is. And then basically from then, that information, um, we could project it onto, this, uh, onto the surfaces or we could work with it. I mean, that was basically the discussion where we, where we ended up. And our first idea for this room was actually that the pattern which is buried under this completely brand new surface texture, um, that we would bring this back up again to the surface without delayering the later surfaces. Um, and we, our proposal was that this would be done through a sandblasting process, you know, and that the sandblasting process would be like a three-dimensional process, which is very much in line with the three-dimensional thing or campaign which came later. And we kind of thought it's interesting that we go back to the original layer, um, also by this three-dimensional process of, of, of uh, um, substructing, basically, carving out, almost digging down, um, the ghosted traces of what was originally there. The client didn't like the color at all. The concept, maybe, but they said, I don't like the green, you know? And then we did the same thing and said, okay, maybe we can even do it in a different color. And then in, in this moment, we kind of realized now we are in a trap. Um, because now it becomes a question of taste, you know? And, and I think from that moment on, it was clear that we have to be very, very careful on this project, that we don't fall in this trap of taste. I like it, I don't like it, and so on. So everything what we do has to be extremely precise, and we have to have a reason for it, and we cannot just do it because we like it. Thankfully, across the corridor on the other side, we had this marvelous company room called Company K, and for some reason, um, the delayering there was much easier. And um, we, we could literally just peel off pieces of burlap and reveal these amazing um, patterns. What is the easiest point to beam to? That one, yeah, that's good. And we were so amazed by what we saw there. And we thought, this is, this, is what we, this, is, this is the solution. This is what we have to get, because this is everything what, we, um, what the history of this building is. You, know, you have the original campaign from 1880. You have traces of what happened later. And you have this, this also these traces of, of age, of patina. So you know that it's not a brand new building. And, and we thought it's so important that we tried to work with that. And we, we, we really tried to convince the client and Shippo and other people that we should delayer this entire room as soon as possible so that we can use it as a model space. You know? and, and we basically figured out it's impossible for us to sit in our studio and develop ideas how we want to do this project. We really have to go into the spaces and do it there. You know? So we finally got approval and we delayed the entire room. And from then on, we used this room basically as a, as a testing field, as a laboratory, you know, to test all our different ideas. So there are, of course, big damages. So we had these big damages of white plaster. That's how you fix it and stabilize it. So how do you cover it up, you know? And the very first idea is, well, there are so many paintings there, maybe we just put a painting on each of these things. Um, <laughs> easy, um, but we thought maybe not so easy then, because of course there's also some tricky locations where it's a little bit funny if you have a painting in the corner of the room. And so um, 
we tried other. We, maybe we take the the color and and uh, of the of the field, so to say, and print it over the plaster, or we put mirror on top of it. So thankfully, if we put the mirror, then maybe it would completely disappear magically. It didn't. It was even more obvious. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so it's really, it's, I, I specifically show this because our steps were very primitive, almost naive, you know, very, um, very difficult. And they got more and more refined, but really only in later stages and over a long period of time. We jump back to D on the other side because while we were working on K, they found out in D that some areas are very easy to delay. And you can see that here, you know. Um, some of these plaster boards were basically just nailed on top of the original surfaces so you could easily remove them and you got the original um, campaign from 8080 and others, this is the example on the right, were very difficult to delay. So you can see how you can really, you really have to carefully um, scrape off the paint really. Um, so we said okay, why, why don't we then basically just delay the areas where it's easy in the other areas where it's not easy, we leave it. So we also, um, it's also interesting because we still have basically all the different times in this one room, like a palimpsest. Um, and then we have a really, we have a rationale for it because you can delay it there and you can't delay it in the other case. But what we really lose with this is that first, uh, you, you really completely introduce something new and you completely destroy the holistic approach of this room even more than it was already before. And then, at the same time, they did do more delays in the areas where it was not so possible to delay, and suddenly it was maybe possible to delay, but with a lot of damage. And then we came up with this Photoshop here and said, well, maybe that's how it would look like, you know? If you delay it and you force the delay process, it could be really rough and really um, but it's still better than before because for the first time you get the holistic reading, you understand the original design intent, roughly, and, um, and you really show what was there in 1880. So one thing was missing, and that's the other thing which we found out is that there's all these metallic paints they used in 1880. And we thought, also, this is too much an image of destruction, so we might have to bring back, basically, something which is unifying the whole room. And that could be these metallics, and that could be our contribution to this. And it could be like a new kind of added layer um, on top of the existing, which would unify the room, would make the damages less visible, would bring back some of the aspects which were so fundamental to the design without really... Um, disturbing it too much. At least at that point we thought it would work like this. Um, so we did a step-by-step -step process. So first the delayer as much as possible. Then that was the result and you know surprisingly like always it turned out that it's actually much better than what we originally anticipated. And then basically in the next step the idea was that these damages have to be filled in. This is something we developed in Company K, and we found out that it's the best that the plaster is tinted in the color of the field, and that we then add this integrated tracery layer, which was still so bold in the first rendering, which is really completely integrated. It's not just a, a, a new layer on top of it, but it's really integrated and brings out aspects of the original pattern which are not legible anymore. So. Again, in the space, we did a whole mock-up. You don't see the ceiling part here, but basically like a strip um, where we delayed the, uh, a strip of the room and where we then could see everything together because it's very important that you see all these things together. And then we could decide all these things, you know, about the colors, you see the different colors here, about the integrated tracery. And we actually really tested them also in the room. And again, you know, um, very different approaches of patterns, what this could be to bring out the original design intent in a kind of new interpretation. And the more we looked into it, the more we felt our layer has to be very, very subtle. And it's really only about bringing back these metallics. 
and otherwise it has to be very much in in tune with the original um, pattern. And what we what is an interesting example here is, for example, that um, if you really go with the original pattern in the freeze area and you bring this out as a metallic, we felt that this is destroying the original overall pattern much more than if we bring out a, um, a circle pattern which basically forms the background of the entire campaign. So sometimes it's really important that you, that you really you know, study this in place and find out what is the exact measurement. So I guess what I'm trying to say is here, it took us quite a long time to get the right um, depth somehow, or the, the right um, feeling for it. You know, it's almost like in the beginning we came with a, with a big hammer and, and, and now it's all very finely um, manicured. And the same goes for the wood. And in the beginning we thought the wood it's fine as it is, you know, because the wood, the lockers is great and, and they look good, they're in good shape, they, they're a little bit rough, but, but they, they, they are very, um, they, they don't, they're not destroyed because they didn't really add too many new campaigns to it and they didn't really add, uh, made so many alterations to it. But then when you look closely, they did change them quite a lot, you know. They, for example, they stained areas dark, you know, just to highlight the, the, the contrast more and to bring out the carvings more. Um, so, so finally, we, we, we even there with the wood, we found out that the, the, the changes were quite dramatic and that we have, whatever we can do, we have to try to bring back this original color. And this goes even down to hardware, you know, um, not that we go back to the original color, but basically that we try to find out a technique, which is in this case just stripping paint layers off but keeping the aging, the patina, you know. So it's really to these levels of details um, we went into the design. And that's why the woodwork turned out so beautifully. And, and, and that's also why these things work quite well, because it's just stripped and not completely revealed. This is not a brand new brass um, key plate, you know. It's, 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 it has been there for a long time and it has aged. And of course, we've been very lucky um, that we have these lockers because through the lockers we can also technically upgrade the building quite easily. So the ent entire air conditioning system, um, we could quite nicely fit into these lockers and abuse them in, in that kind of way. And maybe another small detail, um, sometimes wood carving panels were missing, like you can see here. These are the original carvings. So how do you replace these missing panels? And again, um, in mock-ups, we studied from being very close to the original to like the um, integrated tracery, like, a, like a, um, a raster image of what the original carving was. And this is also what we then finally did. This is the original. This is our kind of replacement panel. So it vaguely shows you what, what it used to be, and it's also done with 21st century methods but it basically brings back this original carving in a very different contemporary way. When we went in the spaces, um, it became more and more clear that the, the lamps and the light fixtures are fundamental to the character of the space. And you can see that by this collection that every space had a very different chandelier and it's really space defining. And it was again Company K which helped us to define our approach there. Um, when we looked into the historic photograph of Company K, we noticed something really interesting is that these glass globes seem to be black or what we think red, red glass. So you have to imagine this is a gas chandelier and then there's these tinted glass globes making the entire space glow in a specific color. And, and we took this as an opportunity and basically used the chandelier in there and plucked other lighting fixtures on top of it, lighting fixtures we knew the, the, the programmatic requirements would require, you know, all kind of lighting things for, for meetings, for installations, for performance, for artists and residents, for all these different uses, different lights are, are necessary, including a possible historic lighting scenario with these red globes. So we really um, tested all these things. And with that knowledge, we then basically again went back into 
uh, company D and, and develop the, uh, a new chandelier um, for, for this space. And it's interesting that you know the company K is the one space which is used for artists and residents right now quite a bit. And actually the artists and residents, there's some leftover of our lighting mock-ups here on top of the lockers. Um, they always use them and, and, and they already work somehow. You know? And uh, it's actually interesting that this model room um, works already now quite well for what this building wants to be. So basically, um, for developing these chandeliers, we did an analysis of, of what the different lighting requirements are for the different programmatic needs. And that basically, and then we again went into the space and started off with very primitive styrofoam and aluminum mock-ups to get a sense of the scale of this thing. Later on, then including lamps to get a feeling of the light quality until we get the final results. And one challenging aspect was in this case, how do you, um, for the historic lighting, which you still want to have maybe sometimes, how do you get this effect back of this gas light? You know? And um, one thing which we tested is that we uh, work with this um, fragmented prismatic glass um, to diffuse the halogen bulb and basically create this kind of almost gas-like um, light atmosphere in this, in this chandelier. I'm completely over time and I should probably stop now because it's also a bit of a continuation um, of the same story. So basically as a summary, um, the original design was this holistic design. What we found was a very much fragmented design and really compromised and really separated in these different zones. And what we basically want to achieve is we want to go back to the whole thing. And the only thing what we also said is that um, if we do new interventions, they all have maybe one common thing, which is the material. And this is the, this metallics thing, you know, because in 1880, the metallics were brand new. And we thought it was interesting that everything which we bring back could also be this copper. And the copper is also interesting as a material because it can have very different appearances. It can be dull, it can be bright, it can be shiny, it can be a fabric, it can be a solid material, it can be a paint. So it can, we can use it in many, 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 many different um, ways. So that way we had our toolkit together. And then from with that toolkit, we went into the next spaces. Um, this is company E now. I go through that a bit quicker. Um, maybe interesting here to see in this image that you know company E was challenging because what we found you know are the three intact campaigns somehow the original 1880 was pretty much there the the later campaign was still there and even the latest one was was not in such a bad condition so and all of them they have their kind of um, rationale and reason to be there you know and, and there was again this kind of um, risk that we, we felt that this is something we have to show, you know, that, that all these changes have to be visible and, and, and that people need to, be, uh, need to be possible for them to experience all these different changes. And, um, but when we when really saw the 1880 campaign, you know, it was clear that we have to go with this one because it's so beautiful and stunning and so intact um, that we have to, we just have to reveal it. And, and it doesn't make sense to to leave bits and pieces of the later campaigns just for, let's say, educational purposes, you know, that you can later go in there and tell people, like, see, it was like that, and then it was like that, and then it was like that. This is not the, what we want to achieve. We want to create spaces which really work as spaces for artists, for performances, for installations, and so on. In Company E, the ceiling was um, the very difficult part, um, as you can see, major alterations, but what you find under this, this pretty expressive Tudor ceiling was amazing and very rich in pattern. So we kind of, um, again, approached or made this kind of delayering approach. And what we found out with this is that um, for a very long time, you know, um, the damages, um, we kind of thought we could maybe leave them you know, and um, make this a really rough space and, and don't even have to blend them in. And um, we delayed the entire room and checked it out with the white plaster um, repairs. And it was so obvious that the repairs are di so distracting from the pattern beneath that we have to do our um, old um, tinting the plaster in field color trick again 
to really make the pattern read in a quite beautiful way. Once we started delayering ceilings and walls, it was also only a matter of time that we would also start to delay the floor. And you wouldn't believe it, but even the wooden floors, you can rip them out, and there's always or very often an original floor under it. And you know, to dig that out is, is again, um, super interesting and, and so much richer than, than what is there now. And this is also interesting because when you go in these spaces, you, you never notice the floor. And then once you know what is beneath, you really understand that this floor is an obstacle and really destroying the space. Woodwork in E, um, replacement of missing doors, again with copper elements, and so on. And then the lighting fixture, um, again, you know, the lighting fixture basically went. And, and maybe just quickly about these lighting fixtures, why did they go most of the time? Be that was because of the electrification. I mean, the electrification changed the building in quite a significant way. A lot of the chandeliers had to be replaced, and of course, um, the chases had to be made for electric wiring, and that really was one of the, um, the biggest um, um, scar-making tissues somehow in, in these spaces. So for this space, and this is now you know, going back to the beginning, the program or the programmatic needs dictate the design of the space. So here we did not go back to the original chandelier in shape and scale. Um, because this space primarily would be used for performances and these kind of things because it has a little adjacent space which is perfect as a little um, green room or back, back, back of, uh, backstage kind of function. Um, so it was important that it's still this object in the middle of the room, but it's a very um, um, uh, direct translation of what the, what the lighting needs are, and that's why um, this mock-up again was so interesting where we literally just put all the lights which we foresee to be used in this thing on a, on a scaffold, literally hanging from the ceiling and, and that's something we then translated into the final chandelier. Okay, I think I, think I have to stop here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm also a bit slow today, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, it was fascinating to see it all over again. And um, I'm sorry to say that there will be some repetition, but I will try to do it in a different tone. I was last in this room with the uh, lecture by uh, Sir David Chipperfield. He said about the Neues Museum in Berlin that it was not a great work of architecture and his work there was not primarily about architecture. It's about ideas, he said. The building is about ideas. A dialogue with the building. On the other hand, the Park Avenue Armory is a great work, I think not necessarily a beautiful work in the ordinary sense, but a great work in a different way. I think the Neues Museum is kind of mundane. There's another thought here, and this actually because Sir David was speaking at the Paul Byard lecture, it was something, this other thought, dear to Mr. Byard's heart, which is what does a building mean? A work such as the Park Avenue Armory, it, it's imposing in its presence, it's commanding, its placement in the city is, by its very nature, tells you something. A, a, a head house and a huge rear end has obvious public meaning. But what do the interiors mean? What do they say? And I think what the topic of this is, uh, this panel more what the question of revealing history. What do they reveal? I should start by pointing out that none of the three presenters, unlike the moderator, Janet Forster, is actually a preservationist with a capital P. 
though we may have achieved preservation or had preservation thrust upon us by this armory project. There have been so many suggested subtopics or sub-themes for this panel that I've lost track of what the main matter is. Nevertheless, as the role of Platt Bar Devel White, which I represent, is reasonably clear-cut, I will plow ahead. Our role, speaking of the mundane, is that of executive architect or architect of record. In other words, our, our job was to support others, to translate designs into documents suitable to record and to provide data in order to form the basis for analysis, and importantly, later in the process, provide to actually provide documents suitable for construction. More than that, <clears throat> the, the role of an executive architect is to order and coordinate designs and their documentation with complicated and overlapping, more accurately, I should say, underlapping, past and present laws and the agencies gov governing buildings in this city and state, and alas, for us to stick one's neck out and be legally liable and responsible for compliance. In general, it also means conformance to the New York City Building and Zoning Ordinance and the rules of the New York State Historic Preservation Office, as well as to be aware of and more or less guided by the Secretary of the Interior Standards. I can't tell you how through the years uh, I've come to love this building and this project, but it's been a lot of it a tremendous torment. I'm a designer. Uh, and, and, and our role as executive architect has been a very different one. It, the Park Avenue Armory, you understand, of course, is a triple landmark, city, state, and national, and probably should be a global landmark as well. The executive architect also coordinates the activities of the team of consultants, in this case, the swarm of consultants. Not a swarm of flies or bees, but a swarm of experts, all of them expert in their fields, knowing far more than I did. Overall, there were more than 20, and though many, although not that many all at once. Some architects of record are quite passive, serving only a utilitarian function. I think that in this case, we were indeed utilitarian, but we have also been from time to time quite opinionated, and we consider it our business to, and I try to do this, quietly interfere and to be questioning of certain approaches and suggested designs, and uh, constantly to comment and disagree. Now, in terms of this panel and its topic, which is how is history revealed, let me show you by some slides, which will be quite repetitive, how physically the revelation took place and how we set about it. Actually, ASCAN has shown you a great deal of how the scraping was done and how, uh, you know, there, there was one slide that showed uh, somebody with a Q-tip. I think there were, I can't remember, maybe somebody in the audience could remind me, there were over 5,000 Q-tips used in one room. How many? 200. 200. Well, anyway, it was an unbelievable number. We probably could have had spread them all out on the drill f in the drill floor and, and have created the work right there. Uh, I have to get to this thing. Point it backwards. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, <clears throat> we did, uh, having started with trying to actually map the spaces b more or less by hand with drawings, not by hand, but with a computer, uh, we soon turned to photogrammetry to more efficiently document an enormous extent of existing conditions, many of which Askan showed you. These documents, adjusted time and time again, form the basis of a three-volume set of 770 drawings issued eventually for, design for the design development process. 
So, I mean, we're still going. We're, we're sort of at the design development stage. Now I'm jumping here. Back, please. Uh, uh, Askan also referred to this, which was a, a great database along with, so that we created volumes. A team was sent out to scan the entire building for important elements and objects. In the end, there were 3,244, and we are still counting. These unique identifiers allow us to track each item and to drop them into diagrams and drawings as needed. They were organized by rooms so that we could then look at a single space and see everything together. Again, I think Askan used this and pointed this out. <clears throat> we also created changes over time diagrams, a narrative and drawings, color-coded plans. Can you read this? color-coded plans and elevations to show time periods and what revealing certain periods would mean or look like as part of a whole. I mentioned 20 consultants. Here some of them are. AKF, mechanical and uh, plumbing and heating, ventilating, so on, Robert Silman, structural, BCA, conservators, acoustics, obviously, JAM, a very important member of the team, dealing with codes. Walter Melvin was responsible for the entire exterior envelope of the building, and others on down, some of them repetitive. Arup, also mechanical engineers, elevators, soils, and so forth. These are just some of them, I think there's 16 out of the many more than 20. I have to look at this. <clears throat> the Secretary of Interior's standards, typically in preservation in the United States, and I think you all know this, the team selects a single, a single appropriate choices of period within an approach versus what we did, a more complex one, our particular one, which is mixed. And that, I think, in terms of the preservation field and generally the preservation movement in this country is, I think, at least some of my staff said, unique. And uh, maybe, as someone remarked to me, it, a mixed approach just shows the confusion of our times. I don't think so. I think it's the right thing. Then here, we based, and I, neither Rebecca nor Askan actually talked about this. We based a great deal on our determination, and I say our determination, because this was really a, a subjective determination of what significance was, what the areas were, and here you see feasibility, condition, there are obviously many more things relating to, to the significance of the artist, those who worked in the space, the events of the time, and so on, the rather obvious um, And here we, we created Um, again, this is significance, what factors determine significance, and this, this was all studied. I mean, this was all sort of data-based uh, and drawn and placed in, in volumes and studied. Here, you, these, com these components, you see whether it's recoverable, the condition, all coded. That is the, the, what, what we, we did, and then what we then took it upon ourselves to do, our historic preservation approach, was really drawing this all together. And it was then a combination of going back to the slide, of, or thinking back to the slide from the, the uh, Secretary of the Interior's standards, pre uh, preservation, rehabilitation, and rest restoration all combined together. 
You've seen some of these. This really just is about the approach uh, and the process here. The, the one thing that wasn't said, I think, was the fact that there, there were so many of these little uh, to get my own. So many of these small damaged areas that we had to decide whether they were significant or whether they just formed what we called the wash of time. And that's another thing I think that uh, had guided us a great deal and that is, was a key thinking process for us. Go back. Ah, well, we saw that actually. That that was uh, the Askan showed that, and uh, it's just that our take on that was a little little different. That because we debated at some times whether this what we did should be didactic. Should it be very didactic? Should it be slightly didactic? Should, in fact, there be rooms where every layer was shown at the same time, and uh, or one room showing one period, another room another, and all of that? And and we did debate this, and and decided that uh, it didn't serve us, that it would confuse everybody, that it would in fact detract very much from your appreciation of the spaces, their history and use, that the blended and unified approach was by far the most satisfactory. This again was a decision we made. This is not by the secretary's standards. This was the way we approached this project and it was um, and is, I think, unique. Finally, Despite an innate inclination to create controversy, I will stop my presentation here and only say that personally, I think that in terms of at least one of the suggested discussion topics, and I quote, the difference between preserving slash revealing and artistic choices, it is as follows. While it goes through the process of relating to significance, significant time, significant people, significant events, purported value as art, and whether the historical thing is recoverable, in fact, it ends up being mainly, or to my mind, pretty much entirely a matter of artistic choice, judgment, and artistic expression is what we will leave behind at the armory history revealed or is it history peeled and informed by mo modern sensibility thank you invite Rebecca and Askan to join us and come to the front of the room and we will discuss this and then open up to some questions and comments. Thank you so much and you gave us a great ending there, Charles. The history revealed or history peeled. Um, clearly an enormous amount of work um, to peel or reveal as well. But I guess my, my comment to all of you, first of all, in, would you say, although there, there's been much press that this is a building that is reflecting the flow of time, are you not preferencing, preferencing 1881 um, by peeling to that point, or is there an intent, perhaps some of the rooms that aren't done, that you would reveal, peel to 1914, perhaps? 
Is that me? Any, any one of you. Can, can I just say, I mean, I think, I think that the building's interiors, if you <coughs> read landmarks reports or reports that talk about it, talk primarily about the American aesthetic movement and how important it was. And it's, it's rare that you get the work of Herder Brothers, Stanford White, Potty and Stimus, all together in one place. So I think that our initial precept was that to the extent that we could get back to that very important work, that would absolutely be our preference. Yeah, I, I think that the, the those layers told us, I mean, it, and it was, it, it was unfortunate, but it was the history that generally the later layers were inferior. Well, they had no money. And, well, it is, I don't care about the reason they were well, inferior. <laughs> just the way it was. They it was were, funny. and right. they, they, that dictated what we thought about them and how we treated them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I tried to describe it a little bit, you know, I think um, in the beginning it was also a little, uh, it was funny because um, we were, it was a process, and, and, and the more we, we kind of discovered these, these early layers, you know, the more we got fascinated by them, and the more we thought we have to do everything to bring them to the foreground. And, um, and, and there was something which was, I, th I thought was interesting that Shippo brought up, is that fact of sh uh, cherry picking, they call it cherry picking. That basically in one room we combine artifacts of different times, so to say. I mean, let's say we go with the wall, we go back to 1880, and the ceiling we cannot really delay, so we stay on a, on a, in a different time, and then the chandelier is from 19 whatever, you know. So it becomes a mix of things, and they've been a little bit allergic to this. In the beginning we didn't really understand what, what their problem is, but um, the, the longer we work on this, actually there are some, some truth in there and it's actually interesting because the spaces actually work the best if all the things are from the same time period and we actually do have some company rooms where we don't go to 1880 they're not done yet you know but we have in our design development document there are some where we simply can't do it or where the condition of the current later is so brilliant and good that it basically it doesn't make sense to try to dig and also what you would find is not so promising or damaged or not mm -hmm. there anymore. So um, it's going to be a mix of things and that's also maybe interesting because you know that whole palimpsest thing or the basically the different times we, we thought for didactical purposes or so on we would like to have maybe in one space, we will now not have in one space but we will have it in different spaces. So you will, that way you could probably read the building in that kind of way a bit later you understand that there have been other methods, um, because later, for example, a lot of it was with wallpaper also, you know, and um, very different kind of feeling. Um, it, it was crazy for us to to d discover that, you know, a room completely um, without these wallpapers, you know, it, it really is like um, you could breathe in it again, you know. It, it really has a very different, um, you even think climate, you know, an atmosphere. In the, much more direct somehow. So, yeah. Thank you. On a different topic, before we open to question, the, who gets to see this? The visiting artists. If you buy a ticket to one of the performances in the drill hall, how much of the, the restored company rooms will be visible? And I guess all this is really leading to a question as Charles said, this is a significant landmark in New York City, in the state, nationally recognized. It is an astounding um, record of particularly of 19th century decorative arts and is well known for that. Um, but it always has been very much an interior building. If preservation serves a public good, how can this be accessible, more accessible, um, in, in some manner so that people can appreciate this work that you're doing because presently the, the price of a ticket and the hours make this not entirely, I would say, publicly accessible all the time unless, unless you have access programs that I don't know about. You do have the kids, I saw that. Yeah, um, no, no, and we're, we're um, so obviously the, 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 uh, we have very reasonable ticket prices, $10. Hard okay. to find $10 um, ticket prices. 35 for performing arts, I mean, we're, this is, this is sort of our level. 
we, we, well, because we really believe in the democracy of the building. Um, but the, the other thing is, obviously, we can't open a lot of the rooms right now, but the bottom floor, it, well, because they're under construction or there are offices, but the first floor is completely accessible. You can go in there anytime you want. You can wander around. Kirsten does tours now twice a week that are, um, uh, you, you can book to, to come and see. And anytime we have any performances or anything, we have uh, material up that explains what these rooms are about. And as we move from the second floor, so we will move our offices from the, that second floor level to the third floor, January 14, then you'll be able to go through the whole thing. We very much feel part of our mission is making this building public. For because, because for so many years, you couldn't get into it. Exactly. So, exactly. you know, you can come in any time and look around, be our guest. <laughs> well, I've actually been You probably privileged. can't go up to the offices. It, well, you could. You probably could go up to the offices. On a tour, you could definitely go. We yeah. know you now, Rebecca, will stop in and see Good. you. Good. But, but and, and thank you for that. But to yep. the point that I think it's an issue for interior landmarking of any sort in this particular, it happens to be this is a landmark that's all about right. its interior, and how do you make that yeah, I, I, known and accessible? I was going to say, this is not a unique problem to the army. Right. It's right. a right. problem that relates mm -hmm. to interiors across the board, and, and uh, it hasn't been solved well. But, but how better than to enliven them? I mean, this is, you know, you give them a use that makes people come. We hope that we'll have hundreds of thousands of people coming through this building when we're finally completed. That's the way to make people see landmarks, make them live. I mean, look at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Seven million people a year go and look at it. That's, that's what you want. You want to enliven the building and give it life, and that's what will bring people to see it. And see it the way it should be, not you know, in aspect, but living and breathing. Far be it for me to compliment a client, but I think our client is actually in the process of doing this quite well. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Do you have any other experience, Askan, on, with, uh, on the um, issue of interior landmarks, particularly in, in accessibility and making this something that can be appreciated and enjoyed um, well, I mean, by you know, th the this public? Is, I, I think this is exactly what this building is about. That it's, and, and that's also why we said yes to this job. For example, if this would have been, I don't know, if somebody was interested in doing this in a, in a men's club, exclusive men's club or something, I don't know whether we would have taken the commission. I mean, we. we we like this aspect. Oh, come of on. Making, Tiffany yeah, and her brother would, interiors, come on, fess up. No, no, <laughs> no, we would have not because then, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly this exchange of culture and architecture and interiors and landmark and preservation and all that, which is interesting for us. And it's not, you know, just going in there and doing some nice interiors. And it's about, it's about the program. And it's really because of the program that we believed in this project, you know. And if, if it would have been a different program, it would have been a different project, you know, and um, I think it's a truly public building in the sense like a museum and so on is a mm -hmm. public building. It's not a train station, you know, but yeah. it's, uh, it's a... <laughs> not yet. <You> just <laughs> That's another way and it's interesting station. because, you know, I mean, it, it covers so many different people, like museums typically, you know, it's a contemporary art museum or whatever, and then a, a specific group goes there, you know, and, um, and other people don't go there. And so you're saying... And I think the armory actually will, will engage with a very wide audience because very varied, yeah. they have also art and antique shows there, mm -hmm. you know, stuff they don't run, you know, which is also interesting, but they're still open for that. So it's a multiple use, very diverse use building, which makes... Sure. Charles. Uh, either Baskan or Rebecca said something about artists reacting to the spaces. And it's very, it's, that's a very important comment because, I mean, especially for performers, generally in our society, a performer goes into a... a a, a made space in order to do it. They don't respond to the space they're in, unless it's very bad acoustically, but uh, in, in the armory, people do respond very strongly to the space, including the architects. I mean, we are also artists who responded and respond to that space, and, and it's very different from other types of projects, obviously. So, out of the experience of doing this, um, um, <coughs> what is y your takeaway that might help inform your future work at other buildings? Um, and I say that to all of you. Um, we, we hope you stay at the Armory forever, but in case you went to another performing arts venue, there are things, and you've talked about how that 
how you have changed your approach over time and had some, some issues with the SHPO's office and other things as you develop a sort of preservation strategy. Do you think this, this gives you a, a new stance philosophically that you could take to another project? Well, I mean, I, this is not sarcastic. I'm hoping my next project will be more or less a glass metal box <laughs> on, a, on a hill in New Hampshire looking across a completely unpopulated valley. Yes, but are you going to take anything from this experience to that Yes, experience? of course. <laughs> Good. <Right>. Good. <laughs> A great deal. <laughs> the use of <laughs> copper, maybe. The use yes. of blackened copper. Blackened <laughs> copper on the, on, the, on the structural <laughs> elements of your glass block or box, okay. Um, and no didacticism, I heard you say that. Can you speak to that, Aska? Yeah, I mean, you always take something of the projects with you to the next project. Of course. You know, but um, I, I don't think, and, but Every project is so unique and you kind of, you have it in your brain and you learn, yeah, there's a learning curve with, with every project and you kind of react differently in the next project and that is probably informed by what you have done before. But again, you know, I think, would we repeat it? No, not really, you know, it's a, it's a specific response to this building, to this program, to this location, to these things. and. You know, next time it will be a different building, a different program, a different client, a different atmosphere, and so on. So you will also have different responses. You know, but maybe some things uh, in, in the same in the same spirit. I mean, we, I mean, it, it's actually really interesting, and that's what, what I tried to say also with that Tate Modern thing. This is not a landmark. You know, the oil tanks. Are, it's, it's it's a rubbish space. It's a, it's a, it's a leftover. It's it's something. It's complete trash, basically. You know, ready to demolish. And what we do, we make it the core of the extension. And it's going to be mind-blowing art galleries, which are so different than any other art galleries in the world. You know, and 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 this is the thing. I think you have to the mythology that you go into a building, and that you really look carefully, and that you try to react to this. This is what we really interested. And and that that other thing you just mentioned. You know, being on the on a hill with an unlimited budget and no constraints. No, I, say it. <laughs> but okay, whatever. I assumed you meant that. Um, is, is a very difficult thing. Is uh, you know I always compare that with this white paper kind of thing. I mean, if you have a white piece of paper and you you basically somebody tells you so now now draw a building. You know well, what do you draw? And um, you need these restrictions, and the more restrictions you have, actually, the better it is, and the, m the more fun it is. You know, I mean, and the creative process is almost triggered by these restrictions. And the longer I do it, the more I like it. You know, make my life difficult, and then you can, you know, you come up with better ideas. And that's what I'm saying. I was uh, with this Shippo thing. You know, I never went to Shippo, which I kind of regret somehow. But maybe it was also good. You know. It was always de them yeah. doing this for us, <laughs> you know, which is interesting because well, because um, like that I got it always like second hand feedback on the proposals we had, and then we had to live with it. And it was always like these guys went to Shippo and they came back and we like everybody like oh no, they didn't allow it. They're not ready for this. They're not ready for that. I mean, like, very difficult, you know. And then you work on this for a couple of weeks and suddenly you think, oh, maybe, maybe it's not so bad and ultimately the product gets better, you know, the result gets better. Glad to hear it. Yeah, let, let me say that, Please. Shippo, I do want to say that Shippo, <laughs> I thought was wonderful, I want to say on the record. They are wonderful. They were incredibly helpful. I've worked with lots of government agencies that honestly had all, always been wonderful, so I'm not just saying that. They were creative. They, when they had issues, they were very sensitive about the way they presented them to us, and and I, I agree. I think they I think they helped yeah, us I through things. It was made the project better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Like that. Great. Well, if there are any representatives of Shippo in the audience or anyone well, else who has any who has any questions or comments, I think now would be a good time to uh, start t talking about that. There is um, a student with a mic, so you can. Um, Look for that so, so that we all can really hear your question. Yes, sir. My question is, I understand, uh, I've heard that the homeless ladies are still living there. Is that going to continue on? Does it have any effect? And if, if, if they yes. are there, what's going to become of their space? 
Right. So um, there is there's a, a shelter for a hundred um, women, um, which is now on the third and the fifth floors. We are, in fact, in construction right now to consolidate them because the fifth floor is only a half floor and it's kind of a mess. To consolidate them onto the fourth floor, um, and the plans are getting done right now, and we're under construction. They'll be moved. They'll be moved back into the fourth floor. On the, they'll be there September. Or say October 2013. They'll remain part of the building. We also have um, a representative of the National Guard. We have 1,800 square feet for the National Guard. Uh, we have the veterans of the Seventh Regiment. We have all sorts of people in the building. So it kind of makes it an interesting. It's like a little microcosm of some quirky little life. That's what the armory's like. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sorry, I came in about five minutes late. You might have mentioned it. Isn't the ownership of the armory still in question? I have a friend in the area, and I was under the impression there was a court case involving ownership of the armory. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think the ownership of the armory is not in question. Um, there were a number of lawsuits brought by um, a group that had been part of the veterans, but actually those people have, are no longer part of that veterans group anymore. One was asked to leave, and the other one... Um, died. Um, none of those lawsuits were successful. So there's actually never really been any question about ownership. Uh, the National Guard, which uh, built the building, was always an instrumentality of the state, never has been, which is why it's always won. Still a terrible waste of money and money that could have been spent on preservation. There's a question behind you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for doing this great work instead of another uh, glass box. Um, <laughs> so my question, I guess, goes to the architects. Um, I was wondering, having the uh, Chipperfield lecture uh, in mind, and you already mentioned that, so I was wondering if uh, in any way the, the approach that Chipperfield took or takes, or took actually in, in Berlin on the Neuss Museum did influence the work on this project or uh, influence the strategies or tools developed for the delayering, for example? It, it, influenced, it influenced me, but uh, we were, as architects of record, we, we were not the initiators of most of the, of the uh, uh, work Ascan's firm was. I think one of the things that I found impressive there was the, his use of tracery, he, the way he left uh, areas of partial destruction alone. I was by far the least impressed with, uh, with his modern interventions of what, things that he actually constructed within the space, but that's a personal opinion. But I, I mean, I, I felt, I read a good deal about it, I went to see it, and I felt uh, very strongly an, an influence there, and I think that uh, whether it was just in the air or whether it was direct, but I think that uh, some of the work of Herzog de Meuron uh, reflects a similar thinking, let's say. Um, no, it wasn't really influenced by, by this uh, work, um, but you know, maybe there are some similarities. I think ultimately it's very different, but of course some of the thinking is a little bit the same. And I think that's only natural because that's really where we come from, you know. I mean, this is the European background. I mean, that's uh, what we all love about Italy and about this, um, you know, I always call it the uh, sweet morbidezza of Italy, you know, this, this the, the patina and the age of the building um, is, is very inspiring and is something you would like to keep. And, 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 and I think that's, it, it's, you know, he reacted on what he had there, I guess, and what his case was, you know, and we did the same here. You know, it's really like um, you have to react to the situation. And some of the tools are similar, maybe, um, but ultimately I think they're also very different. And there are a lot of things in there. I mean, I actually use it like, you know, although I think it's a great project, um, I, I, I also saw things in there which I didn't like at all. And I thought that's, I mean, that's a little bit how it influenced our work. Um, it it, it, it was basically, a on exactly, what not to and do not to also, do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. 
Qu question from, I guess, Kate, I see is next. Um, I just have a question about how the possibility of maybe addressing some of the more negative history that might be associated, not necessarily with the armory, but with buildings that maybe don't have such a pristine kind of connotation. I think that here we see the beauty of the design at the time, but I think that maybe there's also some negative aspects to the history. And like it's a building built for war? For war yeah. and by maybe people of a certain class and things like that. And so I'm interested in maybe how that could, in this situation or maybe in other locations, be reflected design-wise or how that would maybe influence the process of the design. So I think one of the really important things is, so the National Guard was for local, it wasn't war, right. they actually weren't allowed to go to war. Um, well, they could, Until but they had, to leave, they, they had to leave the National Guard. Um, so it was because all men had, had to carry firearms and it was a national militia, it was used for local riots. They, so this particular group um, was involved in quelling of local riots in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, not so many in the 70s, um, 80s, whatever. Um, there's no doubt they were an elite, and so they were representing those those families that were elite in New York. And it's ironic when we take artists around and we look at the, they have lists of, of these uh, people that belong to the armory um, from in the 1880s, the list of the, the names of the families. And you can imagine there's a whole bunch of people whose last names are not mentioned in this list. And it's ironic because when you take people around now, it's all sorts of people that are excluded from those lists. I think one of the things that, that we like about dealing with this issue is one, we're not afraid to talk about it. We have these lectures all the time that address the historic issues because this was such an important building when it was built and there were so many important New Yorkers involved and so many things that were involved in it that we are able to do one lecture after another. It's great. So we're not afraid to walk right up to it. But I think the important thing for us is that we think it feels very democratic now. And it feels like a place where people feel accepted and feel welcome and our ticket prices are low and it's a very kind of, um, there's this spirit of participation when you come to something at the Armory because it's not formal. You don't sit in a fixed seat and you sit here and you clap when you're told to and the art is happening there. You're in and around it and it feels very democratic. So I think in a way, part of the way we deal with this, and of course we thought of it, it's really important to understand the history of the building you work in, um, is I think we're trying to sort of find an antidote to that actually and to open this splendid part of the building to a much faster public. Mm. But I mean, I think it's a very good question because I think you will never be able to hide the history of the building yeah, and, it's, and it's there and you don't want to hide it. And, um, but I, I don't think, I just thought about while you were talking whether it triggered certain reactions in our work and I, I don't think so. But I think it already triggered reactions in the artist's work, you know? Oh, I mean, completely. so, I mean, Jeff Koons put a, first thing he does, he puts a huge it's cannon, cannon right? bitch, huge cannon in one of the rooms, you know? Or this waterboarding kind of thing and the whole kind of Iraq kind. Creative. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and, and I think that's the best thing which can happen, you know, that basically people will use the building in that sense and that they, they um, and, and they can express their opinions and they're invited to do so. Um, so. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with what both Rebecca and Askan have said. I mean, there is no denying that this building was built by snobs. Yeah. <laughs> they really were. They were Terrible. social snobs. Yeah. Terrible. And, and um, <laughs> they, they may have wanted to create a venue for performance, for concerts, or, you know, that kind of thing. But nevertheless, they were snobs. Good ones. With exquisite taste. Pretty good taste, yeah. yes. And money, eventually. They, they had fundraising campaigns, but they, uh, they started with it. Okay, other question? I know Jay's been waiting to speak. Um, I have more than a casual acquaintance with this building. I wrote and researched the Landmarks Designation Report for all these interiors. Um, these are, in fact, interior landmarks in the city of New York, even if the commission is not taking an active role in regulating these spaces. Um, I personally am troubled by, with all due respect, to the approach that's being taken. Um, selecting 1880, 81, and delayering or wiping out all the other layers that are in the building, 
I, I find really troubling because as my report says, um, there were a lot of infrastructural changes that happened early on. The electrification happened in the 1890s. They put in um, a whole new radiator system. There were changes in taste, the same as anybody else. Each one of the companies made those changes in taste themselves. The regiment made those changes in taste. There were, elect there were gas chandeliers, then these exquisite electrical chandeliers came in later, sometimes overlapping and so on and so forth. And some of the firms that did the later work were nationally important design firms. I've heard in the pipeline that there's one of the company rooms that you're potentially wiping out 100% of the designated space to go back to something that didn't exist when the space was designated. So again, I find very troubling. Somebody alluded to contemporary taste. This is in fact what's happening. The taste is that this is an 1880 interior and that's the only significance in it. And taking it back to that where it's neither of, of an exact restoration and you know, leaving frag fragments of layering, I don't know what we're ending up with in the end. So with all due respect, I'm, I'm being very troubled by what I'm seeing. Well, I guess I, I, I responded to that before. I mean, we, we don't do that everywhere. And, and, and I think it, it's still, you know, we, you're going to find enough spaces where, where you have later campaigns, important campaigns and uh, decorations still in place. And, um, and, and at the end of the day, it will be a microcosmos or a cosmos. Actually, it's more like a microcosmos almost of all these different things, you know. Um, but we felt that, um, not we felt, I mean, it's, it's like, it's important that, um, some of these original layers, which would basically be not perceivable at all. I mean, they're gone, you know, the 1880 stuff is really important. I guess some of these images proved, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a work of art, you know. Um, they would simply just not be visible and there's just a green piece of wallpaper or, or something like that on, on top of it. And it's a shame that you can't get to this layer and that you can't understand what what's behind, you know, and that's why we, have chosen in a, a lot of the rooms that we would like to get to this layer if we can and um, and, 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 and that's what we did. Yeah, I'm A lot of it is also damaged, it was really, I mean right. a lot of the, the later stuff is actually, if you look closely, it's quite damaged and then we had the problem that, um, and we were thinking about that seriously, so okay let's keep this, this the current state, you know, and and stabilize it because you have to stabilize it and you have to fix it, you know. So how do we do this, you know, and, and how do we deal with the water damages which are still in there? How do we do with other damages, cracks and so on and so on? And how do you how how do you then literally I mean the effort you have to make to fix these things um, is, is quite tremendous and you, and you feel it's it's like on the wrong surface, you know. You have the feeling there's um, it's also very difficult to, to develop a tool for this, you know, very much more difficult to um, to repair also in a way. You know. I don't know whether that makes sense. But. Yeah, I, I think Askan has said it quite well. I think in the process we were much more respectful of the original surfaces, what you listed in your designation report, than it appears. But the I mean, it's it is so complex, and, and as I said, the you know what we, we, our approach was the mixed answer. But I think that mixed answer encompasses a great deal more, and it shows a great deal more than the designation report lists. Okay. Any more comments or questions? I think we really have run out the clock here and um, d done, done fair service to this. Thank you all so very much for your comments and your beautiful images. Thank you. Fascinating. Yes. Fascinating.